Thank you for this time. Thank you for every child of God in the room. I pray over every soul in this room today, God, that you save them. God, that we all need your grace and pour it over us in this time. In Jesus' name, amen. I do want to focus a little bit. As soon as I saw the fire t-shirts, I knew what it meant. I literally said, Miss Tracy got the Holy Ghost up in here. And I, I didn't see anybody else. All I saw was Miss Tracy wearing a fire t-shirt. And I was like, all right, all right. And I just want to point out to you, literally any time in Scripture after, even sometimes before, after Jesus like ascended, the very next time we see the Holy Ghost is in fire. He burst in in a wind and then t tongues of flames burst over people's head. Read about the Holy Ghost and read about the power in the Spirit. We're not going to dive into it today because I have another story, but I do just want to tell you all fire and the Holy Ghost are very closely related and it's really cool when you dive into Scripture on it. Okay, so today, can y'all tell I have so many notes. How many notes do I got? I actually ain't got none. All I got today is my Bible. 
See, well, normally I have my iPad, right? And I will tell y'all right now, I have about 2,000 words on every sermon I wrote. That I just, that's like my average word. It's not that many when you're talking. It goes by really fast. I bet Pastor Scott's are a lot longer than that, in all honesty. But the thing is, I was reading this, and I was praying over it, and God kind of told me, he said, you don't need anything fancy. You don't need any loud thing to happen. I don't need any crazy illustrations. All I need is his word today. So that's what I'm going to preach from. I'm just going to dive into the word. So to start off, Alex is going to put the scripture up on the screen, and that's where we're going to start today. Because today, I'm going to read into the Bible, and we're going to dig into it together. Are y'all ready? Sure. Sure. That's as loud as y'all get for the Bible. Are you ready for the Bible? Yeah! That's ready. Okay, so we're going to look today in 2 Kings 5. It says, Now Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. Say Naaman. Naaman. Naaman was a cool dude. Naaman was the general of an army. And not only that, he was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him, the Lord had given victory. Right there in the very first verse, we learn not only is he a commander of a great army, he's also got the Lord on his side. He's a great man and highly regarded because of the Lord. He was a valiant soldier, but here's the one tiny little problem. He had leprosy. I know, that's what, I'm going to put up a picture on the screen of leprosy. So, the weird thing about leprosy, and any of y'all ever watched The Chosen, please put your hand up if you have. If you haven't watched it, you really, really need, it's a really cool show. But they're going to put up some pictures of some leprosy up here. Leprosy. Uh -huh. That's leprosy. That's kind of nasty, right? So, leprosy is a skin disease you read about in all of scriptures. It's not one specific skin disease, but whenever somebody says leprosy, they could be talking about a multitude, a multitude of different skin diseases that you see on people. Right here, that's Brother Job. And would any of y'all want what he got going on right there? And can I be honest with y'all? I wanted it to be a real picture, but they were all so nasty, I decided against it. That's how bad this disease was. It was a very, very nasty disease. You don't want to look at it? It was kind of nasty. And something even a little bit more on that, when people got leprosy, it was highly contagious. Like, super, when your friend has the flu, do you go over to see your friend? Yeah. No. You stay away. You're like, listen, sister, brother, I don't want none of that that you got going on. This was the same thing. So when you had leprosy, people were like, I don't want to go see you. They're actually afraid. There's times in The Chosen where they illustrate it very, very well, and that's why I pointed it out, where literally the man with leprosy, they were screaming and saying, I will kill you because they didn't want it. They didn't want to be near him. That's how bad this disease was. That, that's how, it was a bad disease. So now we're going to continue in verse 2. Now bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and taken captive a young woman from Israel. And she served as Naaman's wife. So that is not your normal fairy tale, haddly doodly, but that's how he got his wife. And that's all I'm going to say on that. She said to her mistress, If only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. So Naaman's wife, the woman who's with him and going through life with him, does she want her husband to be healed? Yes. yes. I mean, I would. If I had a wife, I'd be like, I need you to be healed so we can go out on the town and show everybody how pretty you are. You know, you gotta, they want their friends to be healed, and we should be praying for friends constantly. And she knew of a man in Samaria. Does anybody know what man she's probably talking about? We've been talking about him all month. His name starts with an E. Elisha. Elisha. There was like Elijah and Elisha. We're talking about Elisha in this moment right now. So, Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. So he went to his king and said, listen... Bro, I want to go. Like, I want to go and get healed. And the king said, by all means, go. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him ten talents of silver. That's 750 pounds of silver. That's a lot. 6,000 shekels of gold. That's 150 pounds of gold. What? Yeah. And ten sets of clothing. And that's, you don't want to know why I said that exactly. Who said, uh, how did he carry all that? Who said that? Who said, how did he carry all that? Isaiah, you want to know something cool? He didn't carry all that. We learned that this guy is so high up, 
he had chariots and horses behind him carrying all of his money. What? That's when you know you rich, rich. Well, well the horse, what's the horse going to do with it? So he was a great man, and not all, he did not go on this journey alone. He had his servants and his horses and his chariots following behind. So Naaman left, taking with him all of those things. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, With this letter I am sending my servant Naaman to you, so that you may cure him of his leprosy. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes. Everybody just do this motion. <laughs> He tore his rose, which signified that he was in distress. And he was like, why, why, why? And you're like, well, why would the king say that? Well, that's because the king knew he couldn't heal this man. The king knew I ain't got that power. And then he said, and said, I am God? Question mark. Not like a period. Like, I am God? He's like, no, nah, bro, I ain't God. Can I kill and bring back to life? Question mark. That's not like a statement. That's him saying, bro, you should know I can't do these things. Why does this fellow send someone with me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me. When Elisha, the man of God, heard what the king of Israel had torn, something I want to point out right there too, we know that the king did not do this in, pub or in private. This was not in private where he got a letter and ripped his robes and screamed. No, he would have been in a public place where people knew the king was upset. And can I tell you something funny about this king? He knew of a man named Elisha because literally just chapters before, Elisha just raised a man from the dead. He knows, yeah, like, Elisha. You would think he would know. You'd think he'd be like, bro, I got this buddy Elisha. He's a prophet of the Lord, and he knows what to do. So the king of Israel had torn his robes, and he sent him a message. This is Elisha now talking to the king. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me. And he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Elisha was confused because he's like, bro, this king should know I can do this. Like, I've done it before. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots. That's how we know he wasn't alone. He had horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Here's the part that kind of makes Naaman mad. So Naaman was told, hey, go to Elisha's house. So what does he do? He goes to get healed, right? And in verse 10, Elisha sent a messenger to him. Elisha didn't meet him face to face. He sent a messenger to speak on behalf and said these simple words, Go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan and your flesh will be restored and you will be cleansed. That's a very simple statement, ain't it? Like, hey, you got this terrible disease. Literally, all you have to do is go to the Jordan, wash seven times, go do, 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 and he clean. Literally take a bath seven times. Like, is that that hard to be healed? No. Well, listen, I, I think that's probably what he did, wouldn't you? I would have done, like, quick showers. I would have went in and went, shh, one, shh, two, shh, three. I would have done it so fast you wouldn't even have known. Push-ups, well, that might work too. So, so, shh, bring it back down. But Naaman went away angry. He was angry at the messenger and at Elisha and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me, stand, and call the name of the Lord and his God, wave his hand over me and the spot and cure me of my leprosy on the spot. He thought it would be easier. Little thing about Naaman, I don't even know if like his argument makes no sense. The man literally said, dude, all you got to do is go wash in this river. And he was angry about it. That was it. He was angry about it. He's like, eh, no, nah, man, I don't want to do that. Can I tell you something about Christians? And I'm going to go on a limb and say most of you in the room know God. I'm just going to say that. I'm going to say y'all in torches every week, you know Jesus. I'm speaking to the church right now. The church. You know Jesus. You've been in church. You know God. So many times... I'm in a ministry role where I hear somebody say, well, I need God to open this door. I need God to tell me this. I need God to do this. I need God to show me this. Can I tell you what pastors are? They're messengers. Can I tell you what your friends can be? Messengers. Can I show you what your parents can be? Messengers. It's that simple. 
And you want to know the greatest messenger that all of us receive? Jesus, but there's also something else. The Bible. Many people want to know what the God's will for them is in their life. And they want to know where they're supposed to be, what they're supposed to do. And they're asking God for all these miraculous things like, God, if I'm supposed to go down that road and not that one, I want you to send the semi truck right there, right now. One, two, three. Oh, he didn't do it? I right, fine. I'm going that way anyway. Then, duh, 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 you die. Like, come on. People ask for these crazy signs and wonders. And the little thing to notice is that if you'll just get in your word, if you'll listen to the pastor speaking to you, if you'll listen to your parents who can be the messengers of the Lord, Odds are your life will go easier. I can remember growing up, I had this girlfriend, right? The girlfriend was not good for me. Yeah, ooh, it was nasty. We were like, me, 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 me. And my, so what did my mom want me to do? Break up with her. Yeah, why do I need a girlfriend? I was in like, the, I was in like eighth grade. Like, that's nasty. You don't need that. And I won't ever do that again. I won't. But... So my parents were telling me, hey, you should probably break up with her. My uh, youth pastor, Jacob Brown, was going, bro, you know that ain't right. Like, you know you need to break up with her. You like her too much. So I'm like, eh, but I don't want to. I like her. She's awesome. I had all these signs given to me, all of them. But I was like, no, God, I want a sign from you. Well, then she broke up with me and she did it on me with my best friend. Well, I guess that's a good enough sign. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. But can I tell you how that could have made it so much easier? If I had listened to the people around me, if I had listened to the messengers around me, if I had listened to the speakers around me, I feel like every sermon I sat down and listened to, it was like God ver like just straight up telling me through a megaphone and a pastor going, you need to dump her, 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 and I never did. I never did because... The messenger on a platform wasn't good enough. The person delivering the message wasn't good enough. I wanted it straight from God, but a lot of times in Scripture, God works through people. You need to listen to your parents when they say, hey, can you do this for me? Because if you don't take out the trash, you might get grounded. And you may be like, well, I got a mean mommy and daddy. No, if you don't work, sorry, the Bible says you don't work, you don't eat. At least they ain't that mean. Oh, uh, that's facts. See, and you might get rewards. And in Jesus' time, if you, and not even in today's time, if you do a lot of the things in the scripture, you're going to learn you might get a bigger mansion in heaven. You're going to get more, or more jewels in your crown in heaven. You're supposed to work for the Lord and do these things. But anyway, that was my big tangent. I want you all to listen to the messengers around you and the people that tell you to do things, even if you don't want to do them, if they're right for the Lord. So Naaman was angry, and then he called out all these different rivers and he said are these all these waters of Israel couldn't wash in them and be clean so I turned and went off in rage he was mad he was so mad in verse 13 Naaman's servants went to him and said my father if the prophet had told you to do something great or some great thing would you not have done it how much more than when he tells you to wash and be cleansed his buddy is literally calling him out right here and going dude he told you to do something easy you wanted some long quest. You wanted like, to do this great immaculate thing to do it and you would do it. But the fact is this is so simple. Reading your Bible is so simple to get the answer. Yet most people won't do it. It makes no sense, does it? If you're praying for the God to give you clarity and you're like, God, let me have clarity in my life. And then you just have this thing sitting on your nightstand all night long. And you're like, God, give me clarity. And you just sit here for hours and you do it day and 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 day. And you go hear sermons and he's like, the word, the word, the word, read the word, listen to the word. And then you, like, you never pick up the word. Your answer's right here. There's a reason I'm only preaching with this today and it's to show you all of the things inside of this book. I am not taking anything from a note I wrote 15 so odd months ago. I'm literally reading the word and nothing else. So, he went down and dipped himself into the Jordan seven times, like the man of God told him, Elisha, and his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young man. My sermon today is simple. Because you know what? God doesn't ask us to do crazy, immaculate things all the time. What I think he's telling most people in this room today, and it's why God told me to preach like this, 
is because all he wants you to do is go into his word. He wants you to read your Bible. If you don't know how to read, please go to your parents and say, Mom, Dad, can you read me the Bible? There's some awesome stories in this book. There's some revelations in this book that I can't even explain because there's so many different things that when you read, God illuminates something in your life to work on or to fix or to make his kingdom grow. And that's what we're all here for. This book is everything. And it doesn't have to be this book. I have a Bible picture book that I read at night. Yeah, so you're like, what? That's so weird. No, I literally like, I have this and I have a picture Bible. Why? Because I like looking at the images. It helps it bring life to me. Get in your word daily. And if you're not, repent. And you're like, what does repent mean? Well, repent means I'm walking this way. And instead of turning this way, or turning this way, or doing a 360 and going back the same way, repent is you're literally going to make a 180 and you're never going to go back. You're never going to turn around. You're never going to go live that life that you were living. You know why? Because you're in your word. You know your word. God opens up doors. When Jesus would fight the devil and all these things in the Bible, most of the time, what did he use to defend the faith? The word. He didn't even have this whole Bible. He just had the Old Testament at that time. He was writing the New Testament as he was doing his ministry. We have all of it. We have a finished, complete book. And you know what? One day he's going to come back and keep writing it. So I'm just going to ask. I want everybody to bow their heads in this room. Every single person in the room. If you're in here right now and you can tell me you don't know your scripture, you don't read your Bible at night, or in the morning and you truly don't have a private time with God, I want you to raise your hand. I'm not singling you out that you don't have private time. I'm not doing that because trust me, I didn't learn how to do it till literally maybe two years ago. So what I'm going to do now is every person with their hand up, you can put your hand down. I want everyone in the room to pray with me. And we're going to pray for everyone to receive that private time with the Lord and to grow in wisdom and knowledge of God. Are you all ready? Dear God, I thank you for this day. I thank you for this time. And I thank you for your children in the room. God, I thank you for your word. For the word is you. It is the living God we get to hold on to each and every day. And we can recite scripture and we can learn scripture and we can grow in wisdom and knowledge of you. And God, I pray that you illuminate the scripture to these children. God, I pray that you illuminate it to me. And that we grow in knowledge of you every single day. God, bring fresh revelation to everyone in the room of what you want to do in their life, what you want them to do with the rest of their life, where you want them to go and what you want them to do and who you want them to bring to the kingdom to know you. God, I thank you for this day and I thank you for allowing us to be in your house. In Jesus' name, amen.